just kind of curious if um, more, I don't really have a good reason for doing this. It's a, uh, what, why else do we do stuff on the internet, I guess. Um, but more just to see if in the future I could do this either for like the um, live stream or for uh, the podcast community I'm building, castaways.club. Um, see if that would work as a thing to do um, reliably if my computer can keep up with it. Anyways, feel free to obviously there's only one person there, so I guess nobody's going to see this unless maybe that's just me watching. I'm going to turn off my preview. So. Uh, Justin, I'm going to try and talk while I do this. Normally, I don't obviously um, talk. Normally, Justin's show has, uh, and you're not going to see my finder windows and stuff as I switch around. It's just the logic window that I've got going on um, onto the stream just for, so I don't have to worry about what other garbage I might be sharing with the internet from my computer. Um, normally, Justin has a couple of folks, him and uh, his partner, co-founder, John Buddha on the show. This one, apparently, he's alerted me to being a slightly different episode um, because it's just him. So I'm going to throw his audio in there. And then it looks like he's got a whole bunch of um, folks who are maybe guest making guest appearances, audio, maybe clips. We'll see. It's always interesting. Hello, check, check, check one. Hello, check one, two. There's Justin's voice working. Loudness meter, pull that up. Set it to minus 16 lups. Two, 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 three, three, three. Hello, check, 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 one. All right, all right. Hey, everybody, going to do a live episode of... So John, uh, no, Justin streamed this, I think, live last night <clears throat> on his... Hey, folks, this episode is brought to you by... On his Twitch channel and Periscope, etc. I've chosen to just do... We've chosen to just focus on Twitch just because... That's just the way it is. So it is brought to you by podcastinsights.com. If you've been wondering how to start a podcast, this is the place you need to go. Right now, they have a how to start a podcast course. In it, you'll learn some of the reasons people don't start podcasting, how to figure out what to podcast about, tips and tactics to figure out what ideas that people actually want to hear. All of this is 100% free just go to the homepage, podcastinsights.com, and sign up there. All right, so there's a sponsor. Hey everyone, here. welcome to Bill. So I've got a little intro loop here, which was planned before. Move that over. Move the automation with it. We used to do an affected vocal of their um, intro. It sounded like this. Solo that. Where are we here? Mr. Transistor.fm. Just a little gimmicky thing. I think we're past that now, but maybe if Justin's watching this later, he can tell me if we're not. <laughs> there. So we'll throw the music bed on there. Make sure it starts at the right time. There. And then line up. Start of the show. Everyone, welcome to Build Your SaaS. This is the behind the scenes story of building a web app in 2019. I'm Justin Jackson, one of the co founders. John Buddha is not here today, but I've got a great episode for you. Wanted to talk about marketing. How do you get the word out about your SaaS? This is a question I got from Nirav Metta. He asks inside of Slack, how how do you get the word out about your SaaS? Should you pursue partnerships? So one thing I've been doing lately, and uh, depending on how much of this I can stream anyways, I'll show, um, is using markers inside Logic to then export into, uh, when the file's done, into Forecast. So I don't, I can't, I don't think I'm officially doing it for Justin's show. About your SaaS. This is a question I got from Nirav Metta. He asks inside of Slack, how... So I can just throw a marker down. Question, how do you get the word out? 
about your show. He asks like, inside of Slack, SaaS, how maybe. how do you get the word out about your SaaS? Should you pursue partnerships? How do you get distribution for your product? I feel like this is the hardest part. So, is SaaS? No. SaaS is software as a service. Uh, SaaS software as a service. What's the proper way to spell that? S A A S probably. Is that right? So why is his server? Sorry, I'm Googling and you can't see this, I know. Transistor.fm. Oh yeah, build your SaaS, S-A-A. I think I have my template name wrong, probably. Oops, oh, where'd I go? To the end. There we go. Steps, a number of things I've learned over the years. Feel free to ask questions in the chat if you want while I'm doing this. I usually listen at Different startups, uh, different SaaS companies since 2008. And I picked up a few things along the way. So hopefully this is helpful for you. First thing. Number one, and feel free to write these down, take out your notepad, or just go to the show notes, sm slash for, for you. Number one, and feel free to write these down, take out your notepad, or just go to the show notes, saas sas.transistor.fm slash 41. I'll have all of this written out there. So the biggest opportunity many folks miss is building up. Uh, I think actually Justin emailed me a link to the paper doc, Dropbox paper. Um... So I can follow along with his show notes. Shut down email so I don't get distracted. Oh, maybe not. Oh yeah, I just, I just don't know how to click on things properly. So that's handy. Uh, I could probably just stream the. Computer, oh well, whatever, we'll go back here. Out there. So number one. Or just go to the show out there. The biggest opportunity. This is where um, scripting your show, or not, not even scripting your show, but uh, Justin has a great document that he's walking through and it helps both for him, I'm sure, recording a solo podcast especially where you don't have somebody else to bounce ideas off of, but then also um, helps uh, just for yourself to, to uh, both for the show notes later when you're writing up the episode details. The biggest opportunity. And also for an editor many folks miss is building up anticipation before they launch. So that's step number one, build anticipation before you launch. Here's a few examples. Uh, my friends Adam Wavin and Steve Sugar just released a book called Refactoring UI. It's done incredible. Uh, they've, they've, uh, I think they talked about it on the Art of Product podcast. You can hear all of their sales figures and things there. But this was a mega launch, but it didn't just happen overnight. They have been sharing design tips on Twitter and on their medium. I think it's been at least six months, but maybe it's even been up to a year. And every time they shared something online, every time they shared something with their audience, they were building anticipation for the launch of this book. They're saying, hey, it's coming. It's not here yet, but it's coming. And remember, people need to be primed to a certain extent. You know, people don't just can't just get hit once with um, a launch and then just buy right away. They need time to let it simmer. They need time to anticipate this thing that's coming. And so these little micro tips and uh, blog posts and things on Twitter, they helped build anticipation. It's kind of like, uh, you know, getting the, the customer salivating for the product before it's even released. And these tips that they were sharing were so good that people just could not wait for the book and the course to get launched. So great example there. Another good example is Derek Reimer uh, with level.app. He allowed people to claim their username before he launched. And, you know, that's a, a common one. It's been done before, but very effective. So far, 5,787 people have gone to level.app just to reserve their handle. And now he's got this launch list that he can announce the official launch to, or I think he's doing this right now, start accepting beta customers. Uh, 
In a similar vein, Ben Ornstein talked about Tuple.app, his new product, on podcasts for months before. Though you can see, like building anticipation before you launch is is the thing before they launched. And so you can see, like building anticipation before you launch is is the thing. It, it's often we try to you know crank up anticipation after the product is out, but you've missed this great opportunity to get people thinking about it before the product's released. Uh, Apple and Steve Jobs, they are masters at this. Pixar is a, ma you know, movies do this all the time. They release the teaser before the actual movie and it builds anticipation. A lot of people are waiting for that new Avengers movie to, you know, to find out what happens next. A little bit of tea here. That's the important thing I think most po many folks forget when they are mm -hmm. doing a solo podcast is that you can stop and like go back and edit. I forgot that for a long time or didn't figure that out for a long time. I felt like I had to like get every thought out. Weird. Some things are not, I don't think I can see comments right now. Get every thought out on paper. If you are commenting, sorry, I can't, recording. I can't see what you're saying. I'm not sure if this is working either. Okay. Back to the outline. The second thing, and it's similar. That and the second thing is now I can just copy and paste. That's nice. Chip. The second thing, and it's similar, okay. is that you need to build a reputation for being helpful. And this is something you should be doing now, whether you have something to sell or not. All those folks I just mentioned, Adam. Hey, folks, if you're watching, I want to be helpful. <laughs> Ask me questions about podcasting if you want while I'm editing a podcast. I'm Steve, Derek, and Ben. They have something else in common. They've been consistently helpful to their respective audiences for years before they launched anything. And being helpful now in forums, on Twitter, in podcasts, on your blog, in your main conferences, at meetups, in you know, email when people email you with questions, this is an investment in your future. It's an advantage, you know, this good reputation is an advantage that can't be eaten or replicated by your competitors. And so this is, I often give the advice, you know, to aspiring entrepreneurs or aspiring product people, just start being helpful now. Don't wait for a great idea to come to you. Reach out to folks that need help. You know, maybe you need to go on Indie Hackers and answer a bunch of questions. Maybe you need to go to Quora and answer a bunch of questions. Maybe you just need to make yourself available. Wait, did you call it Quora? Uh, as a mentor. Maybe you just need to make yourself available uh, as a mentor. Or maybe you need to go to a local meetup and be, you need to go to Quora and answer. I always thought it was Quora. Justin, well, we're Canadian, so we say things different anyways. People laugh at us, but anyway. Answer a bunch of questions. Maybe you just need to make yourself available uh, as a mentor, or maybe you need to go to a local meetup and be known as that helpful person in a with a certain expertise. So, full person in a with a certain expertise. So, Steve Sugar has been really helpful advice at expertise. So. Steve Sugar has been really helpful on Twitter with design advice. Adam Wathen has been really helpful with advice for developers. Ben Ornstein has been really helpful teaching people how to pair program. You know, these are things that you can do now, regardless of, you know, like I said, if you have anything to sell. So those are the ones I always lead with. Those are also always the ones that people don't really enjoy. They're not, you know, they're not that sexy. They're, they're, they're not that helpful if you've already launched. And so now I'm going to go into some tips for folks who have already launched a product, or at the very least, they have a marketing site. So the big one, and I've had a reversal on this. I, I used to focus on this less than I do now, but this is one of my primary activities now, and that is to bake S marketing site. All right, number three, I think. For, he hasn't mentioned that, but I'll keep using that convention anyways. So the big one, and I've had a reversal on this. I, I used to focus on this less than I do now, but this is one of my primary marketing activities now, and that is to bake SEO search engine optimization into everything you do. This is the most underrated and often nowadays under pursued growth strategy. And there's a lot of folks that are coming around to this. Uh, Ryan Hoover in a recent interview said, SEO is the growth lever that you have and it's something that you should prioritize. Interview said, SEO is the biggest growth lever that you have and it's something that you should prioritize. And if you think about it, you know, when people have a desire to solve a problem, what do they do? Google it, prioritize. And if you think about it, you know, when people have a desire to solve a problem, what do they do? They Google it. If your product is the answer to people's question, you want to make sure they can find it in Google. This is just another way you can be helpful right now. So here are some quick SEO tips. Uh, first, I would just start with a site like answerthepublic.com. This allows you to type in, for example, I would for Transistor, I would type in a keyword like podcasting. And what it's going to do is give you a visual 
a visualization of the types. My just for for anybody's watching later. Uh -oh. um, this allows my personal preference is not to remove every single bit of audio noise or um, you know breathing every um or ah. Like I I my I lean towards natural conversation happening or natural wording or natural phrasing happening that you would hear someone if they're actually talking. It's this isn't in my mind at least most of the podcasts are not supposed to be um, professionally. This isn't an audiobook that you're paying a lot of money for and also isn't supposed to be professionally recorded voiceover work. This is, in my mind, you're hearing, in this case, Justin talk as if he's giving a talk maybe uh, at a conference or you're sitting across the table from him at um, you know, a meetup or something. And so there's pauses and there's times where he's going to collect his thoughts. And obviously you don't want it, like when a, in a podcast form, you don't want it to be a really long gap and an awkward pause where you person's wondering if maybe their podcast player is broken or the show has ended or whatever they've forgotten about it um, but I feel like having a bit of natural language natural um, not natural language natural uh, phrases and a few pauses mentally for the listener is important and it's a little harder when there's just one person obviously because there's it's kind of like a stream of consciousness thought running all the way through um, but I think it's important to sort of give them mentally give them a break and so even in this episode I'm not I'm not sure how long it actually is yeah it's not super long um, but you know it might be better to like if I had more time or we talked about it beforehand have you know maybe little music breaks between each section or something just to break it up give folks a, a chance to like store stuff away as they're listening so Anyway. You to type in, for example, I would for transistor, I would type in a keyword like podcasting. And what it's going to do is give you a visual, a visualization of the types of questions people are asking on on Google. So for example, uh, they have kind of uh, key starting words like will, can, which, where, will podcasting kill radio? Where does podcasting go next? Um, when did podcasting start? These are all questions that people are asking on search engines. Authoritative go next when did podcasting start these are all questions that people are asking on search engines and i could write authoritative blog posts and articles and pages that answer these questions so this is a really good place to just kind of visually explore some of the topic ideas for your website and that's sometimes where people get stuck you know how do i start you know ranking for certain keywords how do i find good topic ideas well this tool does a really good job of visualizing it uh, they also have uh, prepositions, comparisons, you know, there's a, a lot of ways they visualize different things that people are searching for. I would definitely really visualize different things that people are searching for. So I would definitely recommend that tool, insert the public.com. Uh, another tool that you can use is Ahrefs. A I would definitely recommend that tool, insert the public.com. Uh, another tool that you can use is Ahrefs, A H R E F S.com. And it's an, a really expensive tool, actually, but one thing you can do is you can search for your competitors inside of this tool and see which keywords people are using to find their site and which uh, of their landing pages are the most popular. So for example, if I type in briefs.fm, which is a, another podcast hosting company, I can see all of the backlinks that briefs has, like all of the, the sites that have linked to briefs. So can'tcdods.com has a link to the site. And Kent is a well-known uh, JavaScript programmer that works for PayPal, does lots of open source work. So that's a really valuable backlink to have. I can also see what keywords people are using, the top keywords people are using to find this site. Uh, one of them is three minutes because Briefs focuses on three minute podcasts. So lots of really good competitive information you can get from Ahrefs and these will give you ideas on where you should podcasts. So lots of really good competitive information you can get from Ahrefs and these will give you ideas. Start. Hey folks, this episode... There's a shortcut key in Logic that I keep forgetting. It, ha it comes in handy every so often. But if you hit enter while something's playing, so, it just hey folks, this episode is brought to you by to podcast, of really good. which I'm sure is handy for like three minute um, music productions and things where you just want to like, OK, hit enter and go back to start. Um, but I should. Um, well, I won't do it right now, but yeah, I just need to change that shortcut key because so often I hit it because I'll confirm something, a dialogue box, and then accidentally hit enter twice or something. And then it shuffles me back to the beginning of the show and then I have to find my place. So lots of really good competitive information you can get from Ahrefs and these will give you ideas on where you should start. You know, if someone is getting a lot of really high quality backlinks from a certain website, maybe you can approach that site as well or find other sites like it. If, you know, they're really competitive and getting a lot of good results for certain keywords, then you will want to start creating content that, you know, target those keywords. So and Ahrefs actually has tons of other stuff, but those are the, the two big ones.
So an HREP. You know, target those keywords. So an HREFs actually has tons of other stuff, but those are the, the two big ones. Uh, number three, in terms of... Uh, number three, in terms of... Number three, in terms of... A third SEO tip is... Two big ones. A third SEO tip is to make sure you have Google Search Console set up for your website. This, uh, ages ago, Google took out um, keywords from Google Analytics and they've moved them over to Google uh, for your website. Ages ago, Google took out um, keywords from Google Analytics and they've moved them over to Google Search Console. And there's a brand new uh, performance report inside of there that will allow you to see which queries people are using to find your, um, what pages you're ranking highly for, your average click-through rate. So when people land on your, uh, you know, search for, sorry, I give a keyword, what, uh, how many of those clicks do you get? So this department. Something I go back and forth on too is how much, like if it's, if it sounds, depends on how the recording. But or like, your average click-through rate. So when people land on your, uh, you know, search key. So like on having a gap where there's nothing, um, you know, sounds different than Justin's recording with when he's not saying something because there's a bit of room noise. A uh, bit of maybe digital noise or whatever that was on the recording, etc. Um, and I have like a noise gate that will kill the volume pretty quickly if there's not enough conversation happening. But I I generally try to make sure there's no gaps like that, um, just so that it air on the side of like things sort of getting squished together a little bit too much maybe, um, just so that there's no weird gaps because especially if somebody's got the speaker or the podcast playing maybe and it's cranked they'll those, those kind of like little audio gaps are become really noticeable i find anyways when i'm listening to shows where you can it's just like pulls you out of the moment you're like oh obviously that's been edited <laughs> and on your uh, you know search for so whereas that now has consistent it's a crossfade that happens there from one track or one side of the track to the next track on next your track. Uh, you know search for sorry a given keyword what uh, how many of those clicks do you get? So for Transistor Podcast, for example, in the last three months, we get 58% of those clicks. When they search that on Google, we get 58% of those clicks. And that's helpful to know. Uh, it'll, uh, again, it'll help you find the... So it's, it's helpful to know, you know, what... It, so it's helpful to know what query... So it's helpful to know what searches people are using to find your website. Uh, it's helpful people are using to find your website. Uh, it's also helpful to know what... For example, is one eight percent of those clicks, and that's helpful to know. So it's helpful to know what searches people are using to find your website. Uh, get fifty eight percent of those clicks. So it's helpful to know what searches people are using to find your website. Uh, it's also helpful to know what position you are for those search terms, and you know, in for certain terms, you might want to move up. And the way to move up is to write better content for those keywords. All right. So podcast hosting, for example, is one that Transistor is going to be going after. That's something we're going to want to improve. We want to have more folks clicking through on us when they search for podcast hosting. Right now, we're only getting 1.4% of those clicks. We could do better. Now, in terms of writing content, and again, this is a really quick overview of SEO, but uh, and I've got lots of do better. Now, in terms of writing content, and again, this is a really quick overview of SEO, but uh, and I've got lots of other resources in the show notes, but when you're creating content on a page, there's a few areas you should focus on. The, the main one is your main title, your H1 in you know, in terms of HTML, your main title should feature the folk, the, your main title should feature the focus HTML, your main title should feature the folk, the, your main title should feature the focus keywords, preferably at the beginning of the title. So if I'm targeting hosting in terms of HTML, your main title should feature the focus keywords, preferably at the beginning of the title. So if I'm targeting podcast hosting, that should be at the beginning. Podcast hosting for brands. That's the main title. The subheader or first paragraph is an expanded description of the page or the solution you're offering. That's the main title. The subheader or first paragraph is an expanded description of the page or the other thing. If you're just popping in here randomly to listen to this or watch this stream or the video later on YouTube, wherever I post it, um, just to remember that I'm listening to it at double speed. So it feels like you're getting a lot of information pummeled at you. And important to remember if you're editing at that double speed, that obviously people, there's some folks who will listen at double speed or maybe one and a half times, and that's fine for them. But I still, as much as, I don't, I don't care if they do that, but I'm editing for the folks listening at normal speed and sort of 
everybody who's listening at faster speeds or where they're cutting out you know gaps but with in podcast players and stuff those are i feel like are relatively the the outliers in terms of podcast listeners so far they're the vocal majority for sure in terms of what you see on twitter that they use um, silence gap filler compression app or the app has a like a playback feature where it cuts out silence it speeds up the conversation um etc and and that's fine to listen to it that way but but i think by and large from what i've seen anyways in terms of the average podcast listener they're not using those tools i don't think apple's podcast app for example has that built in and so you have to it's people who bought a or found sought out a separate podcast player app for one and then know how to enable that feature as well on top of that and like it that way too because you're obviously listening it faster everybody talks a little faster um it's just not doesn't sound quite as normal but you get used to or it. the solution you're offering and it should also feature those focus keywords those keywords you're going after with this piece of content another thing people forget about is alt text and images so if you've ever seen images in search results, that matter in search results, is alt text and images so if you've ever seen images in search results or videos for that matter in search results it's because folks are targeting certain keywords in the alt text of those images so alt text is the it's designed to show text when an image doesn't load properly or if someone has to use a screen reader but that text is also read by google uh, just like any other content and you know, often when we're putting images into our websites and uh, in, inside of uh, WordPress or something else, we forget to say, oh, here's the alt text. And not only is this good for accessibility for folks that need to use a screen reader, but it's also good for search results. And finally, the meta description. This is a short, concise, usually 300 words or less description of a web page shown in search results underneath your main title. So this is what this is what you're going to use to entice people to click through when they've searched beneath your main title. So this is what. This is what you're going to use to entice people to click through when they've searched for something on Google. Again, make sure that has you click through when they've searched for something on Google. And you want to, again, make sure that has the focus keyword in there and, uh, you know, something that's going to give people an idea of the type of content you have after the click. All right. So that's kind of what matters on each page. Uh, I also recommend that you keep a document on post title after the click. All right. So that's kind of what matters on each page. Uh, I also recommend that you keep a document on blog post title ideas. Uh, I've also called this a keyword content planner, and I've got a, a free example of one that you can use in the show notes. But for example, so the way we, so the way you would use this is, let's say, you know, through all my research, I can see that podcast distribution in the show notes. So the way you would use this is, let's say, you know, through all my research, I can see that podcast distribution is a good keyword combination to pursue. <laughs> yeah, it's fun having the person who you're editing, watching your show, watching you edit. <laughs> it's like, yeah, Justin's staring over my shoulder like a creepy boss. <laughs> I just need like your breathing in my ear as you loudly sip coffee behind me and just kind of like little noises like, hmm, interesting. Oh, making me question every the keyword combination <laughs> to pursue. In that case, I could write a blog post with the title podcast distribution made easy. Uh, how do you speed up playback in GarageBand? Uh, I don't know that there actually is a way. It's been a while since I've used GarageBand dedicated for podcast editing. I use it for music, just for noodling around with quick ideas. Um, but I don't actually think that there is a way to speed up playback when you're editing, which is one of the reasons why I, I made a big effort to try and go to iPad uh, for podcast editing. And none of the apps at, that I tried and could find could also could do this. So obviously, if you're just editing a podcast on your own, it's your show, you do one show a week and you edit it, you could save some time for sure, but it's not a big deal like if you have to listen back at regular speed. Whereas for me, when I'm charging people money for my time to edit their podcast, it comes in handy over the course of I'm editing five or six shows now a week. And that saves me a lot of time, obviously. So yeah, ScreenFlow can do that. Um, my trouble with ScreenFlow, and I, don't, I haven't used ScreenFlow without using video, uh, so if it was just audio, um, is ScreenFlow seems to take a long time to render the waveforms, like when you do a cut, like if I did this cut in ScreenFlow and then was moving stuff around. There's something that Logic is doing that's really advanced or is really tuned into the OS or whatever, where ScreenFlow, anytime I do a cut, um, and shuffle things around. It takes a while to like re-render the, the whole file or the rest of the document from the right, I guess, of the cut. Nation to pursue. In that case, I could write a blog post with the title podcast distribution made easy, five steps. Well, I'm going to put that into my keyword planner. I'm going to use this as you know an idea for- And I've tried, yeah, waveform when rendering is brutal in ScreenFlow. I've tried turning that off. Um, oh, now I'm just gonna make sure the chat overlay is actually 
That's pretty garbage looking, hey? Anyway, we'll fiddle with that for now. Sometime when I'm not actually working. <laughs> Block post title. I've tried turning off waveform rendering or like, but, and maybe, but you, like waveform for audio helps me a ton when you're editing audio to see when the gap is. Like, obviously I know right here, like I can just make a cut. If I had waveform rendering turned off and had to wait and listen and try and guess where the next, where you start talking again, that would be later on and so i'll often have you know here's the, the keyword i'm going to target here's the landing page you know which page i'm going to create this on what kind of interest there is in that keyword based on all the research i did and when i published that post okay two more tips and all right two more tips for search engine optimization uh the next one is write an authoritative guide on top com and all right, two more tips for search engine optimization. Uh, the next one is write an authoritative guide on a topic. So Ben Ornstein noticed that there wasn't any good pair programming guides. And so he wrote one, it's called learntopair.com. And these guides, when they're really comprehensive, they get shared a lot. You know, if someone's like, hey, I I'm trying to figure out how to learn how to pair program, where should I go? Thanks, People say, oh, uh, learntopair.com. They have great word of mouth. They get passed around in Slack and on Twitter quite a bit. And this means you'll get high backlinks to your site, which is what you want for search. The more high quality backlinks you have, the higher you will rank um, when in Google. Uh, one final tip, people search for competitor name alternato in Google. Uh, one final tip, people search for competitor name alternatives quite a bit. So you, know, you might be looking for an alternative to the iPhone, so iPhone alternative. And those are great keywords to target. If you have a competitor and you know people are looking for an alternative to your competitor's product, you want to be one of the search results, you want to be at the top of that page, right? And so you can create those pages and uh, companies like Podia.com have used that technique uh, really successfully to attract new customers because people are looking for alternatives to other products on the market. I have to attract new customers because people are looking for alternatives to other products on the market. Like I said, I have lots of these resources listed in the show notes. Once again, SAA products on the market. Like I said, I have lots of these resources listed in the show notes. Once again, SAAS, sas.transistor.fm slash 41. Uh, let's go into another ad right now because my friends slash 41. Uh, let's go into another ad right now because my friends at alitu.com have again sponsored this episode. They've been so kind and I love talking about them because they make and recording and ed.com have again sponsored this episode. They've been so kind and I love talking about them because they make producing and recording and editing a podcast easy. They just remove all of the hurdles. And I can tell you from, I've been doing this for a long time. I haven't tried any other tool that makes it easy. So one uh, thing I do for- They just remove all of the hurdles. Where is this podcast? Or this uh, let's go into another ad right I think having a chapter marker for the sponsor spot is okay in there because it, the, the fear is, I guess, that people will skip a sponsor spot because it's listed as a chapter marker, so you can just jump over it, um, which isn't completely unfounded. Um, but my approach to it, and I'll show you when I'm at the end of the spot here, is that A, they'll see it in the chapter list, so it's a visual thing where they'll actually see the sponsor, Alitu in this case, in the chapter list if they're looking at chapters on their podcast player. Um, I usually embed a link so that if they do want to, they can click right from the podcast player off to the sponsor link. Whether that's tracked or not depends on the sponsor and how they've configured that. Um, but they So that's a chance for them to actually click and go there rather than just listing passively and check out the sponsor. And then also on the other end of the sponsor uh, Let's spots, go into another ad right now because really my friends at Alitu.com have again sponsored this episode. They've been so kind and I love talking about them because they make producing and recording and editing a podcast easy. They just remove all of the hurdles. And I can tell you from, I've been doing this for a long time. I haven't tried any other tool that makes it easier than alitu.com. Go check it out, alitu.com, A-L-I-T-U.com. And tell them that we sent you if you sign up. There's a little chat widget, say, hey, I heard about you on the Build Your SaaS podcast or Justin sent me or just go on Twitter and thank them. Really happy to have them support the show. All right. So um, support the show. All right. I want to finish off with just a big list of marketing channels because I want to finish off with. Generally, what I'll do is this in this case. And tell them that we sent you if you sign up. There's a little. Go check it out. Alitu. Is put the next chapter marker still with the tail end of the sponsor slot. So if there's like a call to action, a, a coupon code or whatever, that's where I'll put the next chapter marker so that even if you do choose to use this chapter marker, you're still going to hear whatever, 10 seconds maybe of the sponsor spot so that if nothing else, go ahead, skip the ad, 
fair play to you. Obviously, any, everybody could be hitting the skip ahead button anyways in their podcast player, and we wouldn't even know, um, which I'm, I think is fine and fair, just like anything else where you can turn the channel when a TV ad comes on, um, even though the ad is still being tracked by the, you know, the media company for sponsors and things like that. Um, but at least if you're using the chapter markers, you're going to hear, you know, 10 seconds of the ad or whatever, and, uh, might entice, entice you or interest you into as to why they're sponsoring this podcast that you love listening to and go check them out. Cause uh, if nobody checks out any sponsors, then some of the podcasts will go away. So go check it out. Alitu.com, A-L-I-T-U.com and tell them that we sent you. If you sign up, there's a little chat widget. Say, Hey, I heard about you on the build your SaaS podcast or Justin sent me, or just go on Twitter and thank them. Really happy to have them support the show. I want to finish off with just a big list of marketing channels because these are often the things people have on a list and they'll try a bunch of these or they'll try one at a time. And I just want to make sure you have the, the, the comprehensive list. So here they are. Number one is ads. Facebook ads, Google AdWords, LinkedIn ads. You can run ads. You can you can pay to promote your product online. And these are worth... I think it was number four, yeah. Experimenting with. Uh, the bit of advice I would give you is to really focus on one ad platform at a time and you're probably going to need to spend um, a lot of money in a short period of time a lot of money in a short period of time if you want to learn anything so if you're going to do Facebook ads I'll set aside you know hundreds or even thousands of dollars depending on what the product is to really spend on a bunch of different campaigns and then see which campaign variants perform the best that's the quickest way to learn and the quickest way to figure out what works what a lot of people do is they'll just put a little bit of money in a campaign, you know, five, 10 bucks, and they'll just let it kind of go forever. And it's harder to learn that way. But if you're spending a lot of money each day on a bunch of, you know, maybe a handful of campaigns, you can log in every day and see what's working. So if you're going to use ads, I would try to, you know, spend more money and learn fast. And then, you know, after a week or two, you'll probably have some good data there that you can, you know, then basically choose the winning campaign and just go that way. Nice pitch, Nate. Sorry, I, I wish I could see the chat in side of ecamm but i can't so if anyone's trying to chat with me from twitter i can't see it all right uh the next channel is partnerships that would mean finding influencers that have a similar audience to you finding other codes and just go that way uh the next channel is partnerships that would mean finding influencers that have a similar audience to you finding other uh, I, I hate the word influencer i know it's common but it makes me want to throw up in my mouth. Other companies that are similar to you or have a similar audience to you and partnering up. You know, this could be creating an in, in integration with uh, someone, creating an in, in integration with uh, someone else. Um, there's all sorts of ways to do this, but partnership, relationships with people, doing, you know, uh, someone else. Um, there's all sorts of ways to do this, but partnerships, building relationships with people, doing, you know, uh, doing shared campaigns with other people and other companies. That's a great way to go as well. I already mentioned search engine optimization people doing shared campaigns with other people and other companies that's a great way to go oh, and i don't think justin meant like instagram influencers it goes as well much as yeah i already mentioned search engine your, optimization your then there's content marketing which feeds into everything really that's blogging that's you know creating casting that's anything content marketing which feeds into everything really that's blogging that's you know creating videos that's podcasting that's anything anytime you're creating original content and the key here is it has to be helpful and don't try to create content and then get the sale right away at the end of the, the article. What you want to be helpful. And don't try to create content and then get the sale right away at the end of the, the article. What you want to do, this is a long-term play. You're trying to create a reputation for being helpful, like I mentioned before. Then there's platform marketing. This would be things like engaging in Facebook groups, on forums, and comment threads. Hacker News is a platform. Product Hunt is a platform. Indie Hack, I mentioned before. Then there's platform marketing. This would be things like engaging in Facebook groups, on forums, and comment threads. Hacker News is a platform. Product Hunt is a platform. Indie Hackers is a platform. And certainly, you can get a big boost from some of those. Uh, I don't think you should rely on a Product Hunt launch, but it's definitely helpful. It gives you a really high-quality backlink. It gets you know makes a big splash. It gets people interested. So... Platform marketing is great. Uh, direct mail. Now, here's this is an old one, oldie but a goodie. Sending your prospects stickers, postcards, or letters. Uh, I've done this a few times with T-shirts, and um, you know, one fellow Derek was wearing uh, one of my T-shirts, and that YouTube video that he created just took off, and now that's been seen. I think T-shirts, and you know, one fellow Derek was wearing uh, one of my T-shirts, and that you. I have a transistor T-shirt. I don't. No, not wearing it today. So. Very good shirt. YouTube video that he created just took off. And now that's been seen by, I think, I can't remember how many people, 30,000 people or something. Um, so sometimes giving away things is a good way to do marketing. Because if your sticker lands on the right laptop or your t-shirt lands on the right YouTube video, you're just creating awareness for your brand. Again, a bit of a long-term play, but all of these things help. Um, you're just creating awareness for your brand. Again, 
a bit of a long-term play, but all of these things help. Um, in fact, I had this one quote from Natalie Nagelli. In fact, I had this one quote from Natalie at Wildbit where she said, basically, um, in fact, I had this one quote from Natalie. I had this one. In fact, I had this one. Um, in fact. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Shuffle that. Things help. In fact, I had this one quote from Natalie at Wildbit where she said, Basically, the more things you do in terms of marketing, the more you invest in marketing, the more you get out. And so it doesn't always make sense to just like try everything at once, but really the more you put into this, the more you're going to get out. If you're able to get, you know, send out some stickers just as a regular habit, that will help you in the long run. People are going to recognize your brand and um, people are going to recognize your brand over time. People are going to recognize your brand and that's a good thing. And the long run, people are going to recognize your brand. Hmm. So long run, people are going to have a choice to how to edit this here. He says it a couple times. People are going to recognize your brand and that's a good thing. And then the final thing, and then the final marketing channel is people are going to recognize your brand and that's a good thing. So we got to recognize your brand. In the long run, people are going to recognize your brand and people are going to recognize your brand and that's a good thing. And then the final marketing channel, people are going to recognize your brand over time and um, people are going to recognize your brand and that's a good thing. And people are going to recognize, it'll help you in the long run. People are going to recognize your brand that. People are going to recognize your brand, and that's a good thing. And then, and just to make sure it makes sense, just as a regular habit, that will help you in the long run. People are going to recognize your brand, and that's a good thing. And then, the final marketing channel is events. This is attending trade shows, conferences, meetups, handing out business cards, um, sponsoring events. Uh, just make a lot of folks just make events. Their makeup business cards, sponsoring events, uh, just make a lot of folks just make events their main focus. They'll just go to tons and a lot of folks just make events their events. A lot of folks just make events their main focus. They'll just go to tons and tons of events, and they'll talk to people. They'll it, especially if your customers are there. It's a great way to you know get the word out. It's a great way to relationship. It's a great way to you know events and they'll talk to people they'll it, especially if your customers are there it's a great way to you know get the word out it's a great way to start that relationship it's a great way to you know maybe send some follow up emails and start a sales process Whew. so that is the big list hopefully that's helpful for sales process Whew. so that is the big list hopefully that's helpful for folks uh, a few things to remember marketing doesn't work like a jackpot you're not going to hit that one that's helpful for folks. Maybe put a chapter mark here. A few key things to remember. Uh, a few things to remember. Marketing doesn't work like a jackpot. You're not going to hit that one thing that works and create an avalanche of sales. Instead of you know putting it all on black, uh, I, it's better for diversify sales. Instead of you know putting it all on black, uh, I, it's better for you to diversify your marketing investments. So you'll emerge from, I, it's better for you to diversify your marketing investments. So you'll get customers from a variety of channels and tactics. For example, I think Transistor gets about third of its, you'll get customers from a variety of channels and tactics. For example, I think Transistor gets about 30% of its leads from search right now, from, you know, people typing, searching for something on Google. Uh, we get a lot of, we're, we're getting some, you know, search right now from, you know, people typing, searching for something on Google. Uh, we get a lot of referral traffic. We're getting some, you know, quite a few sales from our affiliates, uh, transistor.fm slash affiliates, by the way, if you want to sign up for that. Oh yeah, you should definitely sign up. You should sign up for Transistor by using the link in the chat right now. <laughs> anyway. You want to sign up for that. So you're going to find customers from different channels and you might need to try a few things before that. 
you're going to find customers from different channels and you might need to try a few things before you figure out something that works for you. Number two, marketing is a lot like physical fitness for you. Number two, marketing is a lot like physical fitness. Small gains every week will give you the biggest gains in the long term, right? It's like you don't want to just hit the gym once January 1st and expect to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. You've got to do something every week and every day really to get good results overall. So keep investing in this. Keep tweaking your homepage. You know, keep tweaking your ad copy, your homepage. You know, keep tweaking your ad copy. Keep working, working, working. Keep tweaking your ad copy. Keep working, page. Keep tweaking your ad copy. Keep working, working, working. And eventually, this will pay off, assuming that your product is good. And this is <laughs> my favorite quote, that your product is good. And this is <laughs> my favorite startup quote of all time, Peldi from Balsamic. He says, you know, if you create a great product, everything else kind of just takes care of itself. The marketing kind of takes care of itself. When you create something that's really helpful for people and it's well executed, people are going to talk about it. So none of this advice if your product isn't good, people are going to talk about it. So none of this advice will work if your product isn't good. Yeah, and you know, I know that for a lot of you, this is what you do not like at all. <laughs> uh, you don't like marketing, product isn't good. And you know, I know that for a lot of you, this is what you do not like at all. <laughs> uh, you don't like marketing, you maybe are really into writing code or really into design. The best way to deal with a big overwhelming challenge is to break it into smaller pieces. Design. The best way to deal with a big overwhelming challenge is to break it into smaller pieces. So if this is confusing for you or challenging for you, just pick one tiny thing you can do today or you can do this week. Try one little thing. And I'll say, I'll just interject here. Uh, just I know I'm not on the show with Justin, obviously, but you're maybe watching this later and you're a podcaster or a wannabe podcaster or you have a you're a software developer building your own SaaS and you're listening to Justin's show, I would just say that um, obviously what Justin and John are doing with their podcast is a great way to sort of talk about your, your app and your thing in podcast form and audio form so that people listen and become familiar with you and develop a more a stronger connection to whatever it is you're building. So even if the thing, the software thing is not, readily apparently like an obvious way to do a podcast about whatever your service is maybe or the, the the thing that people would come to your website for modeling it after what modeling your podcast after what john and justin have done with their podcast obviously it's uh, it feels fairly obvious that like a, a podcast hosting company should have a podcast because it kind of like goes together and a lot they can talk about but something like what's another show that i had called code pen radio codepen.io it's a, it's a web app, a service that is built to allow coders and programmers to essentially try out different things, build things on the web that's then shareable. Um, and so in HTML, CSS, etc. But they have Copen Radio, which is their podcast, where they talk about not like, there's a bit of like a marketing pitch to it. And, and as they're now in their, I forget how many episodes they're in into, but they're, you know, in the hundreds of episodes, they are refining it a bit more to be like here's some cool stuff that you can get if you upgrade to CodePen Pro and why you might want to do that because they've covered a lot of the bases but the first 80 100 episodes of the show were uh here's how we're doing we're building this thing here's the software we're using here's how we're hiring here's the process we're using for um customer support and talking about all the other aspects of it so it's not so much like a pitch for the software itself uh, but that comes as a byproduct of what they're doing on the show because obviously if you're into HTML, CSS, there's a very good chance that you're also into server tech and su customer support because the thing that you're probably building on the web touches some area of those things as well. And so you might be curious how a, a startup like CodePen uh, builds out customer support or what, I don't know, what server tech and what software they're writing their app in and things like that. And um, Chris Coyer and the team there have, almost gone another way to not make it a, a pitch to use the software or, or to pay to upgrade the software um, 
but just kind of make it an interesting conversation for developers and front end and back end folks to listen to and, and get ideas from how they're running their business. But um, anyway, a little extra tidbit. I don't know who or <laughs> as I watch, as I'm saying this right now, there's one person viewing, which I have a feeling is maybe just my own preview watching. Um, but I know that I'm going to probably export this out to like uh, my YouTube channel or whatever and show a bit of behind the scenes of how I had a podcast. Um, so maybe that'll, someone will listen and, and be inspired by that. So anyway, here we go. And, you know, break it into small pieces and just build your habit that way. All right. Again, sorry, folks, I can't see your comments if you're on Twitter. Uh, comment thing is broken. I guess I could look down like crazy, though. Live now. Raven here. Hey, folks, I don't think that's available. Should I see them there? Uh, all right. Going in my... On here. How long have I been going? 32 minutes. Okay, so I'm going to try to... <clears throat> All right, so moving on now, responses to the last episode, uh, Casio uh, on. All right, so let's do a little bit of follow-up responses to the last episode. Uh, there was one on smart. Sp so one thing while I'm editing, this is that's handy actually in terms of what I'm using to edit. I use the, looks like I might break something, but... Um, Magic Trackpad, Apple's mouse trackpad device. Um, I switched to it when I got this iMac a few years ago, picked it up with that, and I was skeptical that I would actually like it or that it wouldn't give me like carpal tunnel or whatever. Um, but it's actually worked really well, and I like it because I can do the quick like zoom in and zoom out, which you can do with the Magic Mouse now, Just I think. Build your habit that way. All right, so let's do a little bit. Um, but I find it to be very intuitive and, and helpful in terms of when I'm editing, especially audio or video for that matter, zooming in, zooming out quickly. Uh, so we call this follow-up from, follow from last episode. All right, so let's do a little bit of follow-up responses to the last episode. Uh, there was one on smart speakers. Uh, Casio or Casio says, I was listening to the latest episode and I thought I could add a data point Regarding smart speakers, I have multiple Google smart speakers around the house, so they are usually available in every room. Listening to music on Spotify, adding stuff to our grocery list and calendar, setting timers are the most common use cases, but I also listen to podcasts. So in the morning when I'm making breakfast, I'll say, play the news, and it will play the latest episodes of hourly news shows from NBC, CBC, whatever else you set up. Uh, I also like to listen to podcast speakers for the sound quality, especially when you have when you have multiple speakers in a room and the convenience of not having whatever else you set up. Uh, I also like to listen to podcasts on smart speakers for the sound quality, especially when you have multiple speakers in a room and the convenience of not having my especially when you have multiple speakers in a room and the convenience of not having to pick up my phone to control it. So, that's a good data point. Uh, we neither John nor I have smart speakers, and so roll it. That's a good data point. Uh, we neither John nor I have data point. Uh, we neither John nor I have smart speakers, and so we were like, ah, is this smart speaker thing going to be big? It's a good data point. Neither John nor I have smart speakers, and so we were like, ah, is this smart speaker thing going to be big for podcasts? So far, the analytics say no. There's they're not showing up in any great number in our analytics, but maybe we'll see. Maybe, no, they're not showing up in any great number in our analytics, but maybe we'll see. Maybe folk, this is just the beginning, but maybe we'll see. Maybe folk, this is just the beginning, and like Casio, more folks will be. Maybe this is just the beginning, and like Casio, more folks will be doing that. Now, the biggest piece of feedback we had was how to pronounce doing that. Now, the biggest piece of feedback we had was how to pronounce Worcestershire, Worcest Worcestershire sauce. Uh, so I'm going to play a few of these. Here's Marcus Clearspring. Okay, so he's obviously got Marcus Clearspring. Throw this on.
So let me audio. Let's see what it sounds like. I'm just going to use Marcus John. Clearspring. Oops, not record. What is going on? Logic's being a weirdo. Somehow I managed to record my mic into the <laughs> Marcus. Hi, John and Justin. The famous source is pronounced Worcester. Worcester. I know it's totally counterintuitive, but I guess that's because the pronunciation has stayed the same while modern spelling has changed. It's similar to Leicester, which is spelt Leicester or Leicester, but pronounced Leicester. There are lots of British place names that are pronounced totally differently to the way they're spelt, at least uh, Worcester. I know it's totally counterintuitive, but I guess that's because the pronunciation has stayed the same while modern spelling has changed. It's similar to Leicester, which is spelt Leicester or Leicester, but pronounced Leicester. There are lots of British place names that are pronounced totally differently to the way they're spelt, at least according to modern spelling. If you spelt it using modern spelling, it would probably be W double O S T E R. Like the can has stayed the same while modern spelling has changed. It's similar to Leicester, which is spelt Leicester or Leicester. Kudos to Marcus, for, by the way, for recording a very high quality. That are pronounced totally different. O S T E R. Like the character Bertie Worcester in the famous Jeeves comedies. comedies now this was we must have really hit a chord with folks from the uk because all of the voice responses to this episode were from folks in the united kingdom here's johnny here's his answer i think i'll just put them on different tracks just to keep the eqs and levels the same so i don't have to worry about this goes on johnny oh sorry i'll copy and paste i'll duplicate the track and then um adjust accordingly but rather than adjusting individual levels and automation and stuff so this one looks like it'll be a little louder hi john and justin this is this is johnny from the uk long time listener uh uk is home of worcester and worcestershire i can confirm that the pronunciation of worcestershire sauce is in fact worcestershire sauce Worc hi john and justin this is johnny from the uk long time listener uh, UK is home of Worcester and Worcestershire. I can confirm that the pronunciation of Worcestershire sauce is in fact Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire sauce. Thanks. Worc Worcestershire. Worcestershire sauce? <laughs> I'm probably still saying it wrong. Uh, and then here's Tristan. Sauce. Thanks. Worc Worcestershire. Worcestershire sauce? <laughs> I'm probably still saying it wrong. Uh, and then here's Tristan, also from the UK. Tristan. Tristan, something like that. Tristan, there we go. So I'll just refer to these so I can see. Uh, yeah, but sometimes I color things, um, tracks and stuff, so it's easier to contrast. Okay. Hey there, Justin. It's Tristan from the Cliff Notes podcast. Uh, you were just asking recently uh, how to say the name of a sauce to go in a Bloody Mary. It's Worcestershire, not Worcestershire, <laughs> Worcestershire. Thank you. And enjoy the show. They all sound different to my ear, too. Let's see what Justin says there. Enjoy the show. <laughs> Worcestershire. Worcestershire. So hopefully I'm saying that right now. I'm probably not. Uh, also from the UK, Tim Abel had a question or a comment about partnerships. Duplicate 
that. Call this one Tim. Tim Abel. Whoa. That's the wrong one. I just want to see what Justin says here. Is he's Oh, this one's loud. I'll turn it down a bit. Here we go. Hi, it's Tim Abel here. I'm a software developer from Reading in the UK. Uh, I'm a contractor by day. I'm working on SQL Schema Explorer as a side project by night, as you know. Um, I have a question about the relationship uh, between uh, yourself and your partner on Transistor. Um, so I occasionally come across people who think it would be nice to have a software developer as a partner for their idea. And one of the things that has always worried me is that I'll end up in a situation where we start building things and then I get, uh, no offense to you, <laughs> a steady stream of harebrained ideas that don't move the needle with the expectation that a software developer just build those in unrealistic timescales. Now, obviously, you know a lot about software development management, but uh, I was wondering how you, between the two of you, you manage that dynamic. Cheers. Thanks again for the show, the Build Your and everything you're doing for podcasting. I'm a great fan of the podcasting. Thanks. All right. So that's a good question, actually podcasting thanks all right so that's a good question actually uh, basically tim's <laughs> wondering basically tim is basically tim's i was about to say before the the uh, follow-up part you could almost tell and, and this isn't a knock against justin but a lot of podcasters especially if you're doing like a 20 to 30 minute show or longer on your own uh by the last half of it or the last 25 percent or whatever your energy level is less than at the beginning. And so your mic technique, you might be sitting further away from the mic. You you're, you just have less energy in your voice or you're not paying as much attention to how you're speaking. You, know, you just get tired, obviously, of doing that. And But knowing what... I've never actually met Justin in person, but knowing what I do know about him, he is a extrovert, gets a lot of energy from people. And so a solo show for him is probably, I'm going to guess... Um, he enjoys it because he gets to talk. He likes to talk. But also, uh, he doesn't have someone to feed off of to get energy from in in the most literal sense of an extrovert-introvert relationship. And so now you can hear as he's incorporating even just audio from other folks that he can bounce off of, um, the energy level in his voice is, is picked up again, is picked up. And uh, I'm making a lot of assumptions and things. Obviously, he might have just had a crap night of sleep because he's got like 16 kids and and who knows what the situation is when he recorded but uh that idea of like even just if you can get and getting voicemail and audio from listeners is a tough slog because you can put the request out there and you get one or you get nothing and time after time you're, you're asking and nothing and and justin because of the audience that they've built over time not just because of the podcast but because of the listenership the readership sorry that he's built through the stuff that he's written the tweeting everything else he's done writing products he's sold built up an audience that is hungry for more of whatever's in his brain uh, besides maple syrup. And so he is able to put out a call for feedback from people and they'll send it. And even unsolicited feedback, good or bad, comes your way at that kind of level or whatever. But it's not a thing that happens overnight and it's something that you have to build up to. And so don't be discouraged if you're a new podcaster and your show is maybe getting listened to. There's a few hundred people listening or whatever. But when you ask for feedback, reviews, whatever, tweets, etc., nothing happens because it's like I think there's some magic tip of, tipping point I don't know what the number is exactly it's not like it's at 2,000 followers on Twitter or at 500 listeners or whatever the number is there's some each niche is probably different some amount of people listening who are interested enough in the show to listen but then also so interested that they're willing to act on it whether it's through social media through um, leaving reviews sending you video feedback etc I've always been the kind who assumes that podcasters and creators on the internet want feedback. And so not like negative flame, flaming um, uh, criticisms, but just like have a little bit of fun with whatever they're doing and send them tweets or send them a response to their Instagram story or whatever. I just always assume that that's kind of why all of us are doing this kind of stuff is to interact with the humans out there. But um, I digress. Let's get this finished here, Chris. <laughs> It's almost lunchtime. All right. So that's a good question, actually. Basically, Tim is worried that he'll partner up and the other person will be a pain in the ass. <laughs> and I mean, there's a few different ways you could probably uh, get around be a pain in the ass. <laughs> and I mean, there's a few different ways you could probably uh, get around. Okay. So there's, so there's a few different ways you can address this. 
one, hopefully the person you're partnering in, in the ass. <laughs> and I mean, there's a few different ways you could probably experience with. <laughs> so there's a few different ways you can address this. One, hopefully the person you're partnering up with has some experience with the software development process. So I've been a product manager since 2008. I understand the development cycle. I understand how to write a user story. I understand you know, how a, you know, sprints work. I understand all of those things. And so I've learned over now 10, 11 years of working alongside developers how to you know, work professionally alongside developers. I've learned how to be respectful. I've learned you know, how to write really good user stories with the right details. Um, and additionally, I bring something else to the table, which is a really in-depth understanding of the customer that comes from doing research, that comes from doing customer support, that comes from recognizing patterns. Th those are things that I've learned and I've gotten better at over my whole career. And that's the kind of person you want to partner up with. In the same way, if you are a you know marketing, if you're a marketing person and you write details, um, and additionally, I bring something else to the table, which is a really in-depth understanding of the customer from um, doing research, that comes from doing customer support, that comes from recognizing patterns. Uh, th those are things that I've learned and I've gotten better at over my whole career. Th those are things that I've... Those are things that I've learned and I've gotten better at. Patterns, those are things that I've learned and I've gotten better at over my whole career. And that's the kind of person you want to partner up with. In the same way, if you are a you know marketing if you're a marketing person, if you are a you know marketing, if you're a marketing person and you're really good at marketing, make sure you're partnering up with a. If you are a if you're a marketing person and you're really good at marketing, make sure you're partnering up with a developer that knows their stuff. Make sure that they write you know uh, they're covering their code with tests. Make sure that they are up to speed on like if they're doing a lot of front end development, they understand you know the latest in JavaScript development. If they're you know going to be doing any design, make sure that they understand how to use the latest thing in CSS or the most effective thing at least. So this is a uh, this is something that goes kind of both ways, right? You want to be able to respect the person you're working for, effective thing at least. This is something that goes kind of both ways, right? You want to be able to respect the person you're working for, and the only way to figure that out is to spend time with people, to build lots of relationships, and you will see who the professionals are. They, you know, you'll see them. They'll rise above the rest. Professionals are they, you know, you'll see them. They'll rise above the rest. So that's my advice there. They, you'll see them. They'll rise above the rest. So that's my advice there. Hopefully this episode has been helpful to you. I try to, you know, so even when John can't be around, I want to end by thanking our Patreon supporters. These folks contributors a month there. Hopefully this episode has been helpful to you. I try to, you know, still put out a show even when John can't be around. I want to end by thanking our Patreon supporters. These folks contribute over $600 a month and make sure that we can edit the show. So thank you to Colin Gray at Alitu.com, Darby Frey, Samori Augusto, Dave Young, Brad from Canada, Kevin Markham, Sammy Schuchert, Brand Shouter, Mike Walker, Adam Duvander, and say it with me, Dave Junta. And then there's also PodcastInsights.com. Thanks again, folks, and I will see you next week. All right, so that's like. All right, so let's find the audio. End of show audio. Just throw this up to the top here. And line it up. Me, Dave Junta. And then there's also podcastinsights.com. Thanks again, folks, and I will see you next week. Hey, folks, this episode is brought to you by podcastinsights.com. Oh, what happened here? So I always go back and make sure <laughs> as... Hey everyone, welcome to Bit. Something happened with my tracking there. So that's where a good old command or no, Shift F grabs everything to the right of the cursor. Shuffle it all over. Hey everyone, welcome to Build Your SaaS. This is the behind-the-scenes story of building a web app in 2019. I'm Justin Jackson, one of the co-founders. So normally this this podcast, this specific show, has two hosts, John and Justin. And so there's a bit more time of that I spend 
going back and forth between them cutting out because they're over a Skype call usually. Um, yeah, but going back and forth between the two of them. Um, and not, not as much this time, but obviously having some of the audio questions sent in and, and uh, covering some of the gaps for, for Justin where he's talking. One thing when you're doing an export from Logic, if you're doing the double speed, so you're listening at... Folks that need help, you know, maybe you need to go on Indie Hackers. And before you go, uh, Command B is the bounce, but file bounce project or section is what I do, is uh, make sure you turn that off because for whatever reason, Logic decides to leave it in uh, double speed, very speed mode when you bounce the entire project out. I don't know why. I don't. I can't imagine why you'd want to leave it in uh, 2x mode. Um, but that's the way it is. Build your SAS. Build your SAS. I think I have it backwards. The reason why it's important for naming, uh, naming similarities. Oh, I have it right. Good. Um, is because uh, overcast, no, over forecast, the app I use here, I'm going to switch um, OBS to being desktop now, see if this, oh yeah, because you, you don't even get the overlays of logic coming through all the windows, turn off that, turn on that. Let's see if that goes the same. Same speed, anyway. So this computer, just for reference, that's a, what was a 30 minute file. Um, this is a, I'm streaming with OBS. I'll turn off the preview here, I guess. Um, streaming with OBS, got Logic Pro exporting, bouncing a full quality, whatever, wave file. Um, I think it probably goes a little bit quicker if I'm not streaming when I do this. I would, I would kind of assume so, but maybe there's different parts of the processor that are used for each, each thing. Um, it feels like it would go quicker because there's just one audio file here. Normally there's, like I said, at least two. Some shows I do have three or four guests or three or four hosts or people talking. Um, the big thing that adds a lot of extra processor time actually to the podcast that I could do in, um, I could run it through, um, RX sevens noise reduction. They have a voice cleanup filter, basically plugin that I use on all voices. And, um, I could run the files through that quickly beforehand so that then it's already cleaned up and the plugin isn't running inside of logic, re using up resources and things, but I've never had too much of a problem with it to add that to the pre my pre um, setup for a podcast, but I know some podcast editors do that, run everything through RX7 beforehand, bounce that out, uh, and then work from that file. Just frees up resources inside of Logic. So when I if I have a show with a lot of guests, then that's certainly what I would do, um, just to save processing power while you're editing. Because again, you don't want Logic to start slowing down while you're trying to make quick edits and having it barf on the preview or the playback of it all the time because it's trying to process whatever 10 files or something if you've got a bunch of guests so this will just take a few more moments hopefully if uh while this is happening if you are curious about what i'm doing here or why i'm doing this normally good stuff is a podcast network that we we actually stream podcasts that we record live on this twitch channel on uh, uh, twitch.tv slash good stuff underscore fm and uh, I'll probably post this on my YouTube channel. So if you're watching this on YouTube, it's um, I'm a, my business is Lemon Productions. And that's uh, who, for example, Justin has hired me, Lemon Productions, to edit the podcast. And so you can visit lemonproductions.ca to check out my business. And if you'd like to hire me or book a consulting call, I happily spend an hour or two with folks trying to troubleshoot their podcast ideas or their workflows, um, Audio Hijack, Logic Pro, any sort of Mac-based for now anyways. Um, podcast or audio editing stuff is what I do and I have a YouTube channel that you're watching this on I guess right now that has a bunch of YouTube videos on how to edit podcasts and how to use uh, audio apps on the Mac it's kind of like anything that I find interesting and people request for me is what I publish videos on my YouTube channel it's not there's no regular production schedule for it it's when I have time and when I'm inspired 
to do so. Um, so if that interests you, then feel free to hit that subscribe button and the bell as you do on YouTube. But yeah, if you follow our Twitch channel, follow me on Twitter. I'm iChris on Twitter. I'll twi tweet out when I go live. Uh, okay, so forecast is this little doodad here. It's from uh, Marco Arment, I think. And basically he, um, for his own podcast editing work that he does for, on the shows that he does, uh, he built this tool, an encoding tool. So I export a high-quality WAV file out of um, Logic, and then I can drag it into forecasts and you'll see it uh, grabs all the chapters and the show artwork because it knows the file name and uses that as a template and uh, I'm gonna go grab I forget what he called this SAS marketing let me just leave it that's not I don't know if he always SAS marketing this is just what plays or is shown in the player so they have, uh, because the transistor has um, great um, metadata and show details, episode details, etc. I don't really need to put a lot of stuff into this unless they really want me to. For my own shows, I do. Um, and for a couple of clients, I do where they, where I'm writing the summary and things like that. But uh, Justin does his own show notes, which is great. Uh, one cool feature of forecasts, I don't know if you can see this on the stream, but uh, because I put the chapter marker in as sponsor colon alitu. Oh yeah, I was going to put that in alitu.com. Um, let me just confirm that that's the actual URL. Looks like it is. I can actually put the link URL here. And for bonus marks, you can put a quick screenshot. Done in as well, which will display on the podcast player when technically I should change this to a J. Oh, that's pretty small. Let me just run it through image optimization. Shave off a couple kilobytes. So then in the podcast player, that image will show up as a bookmarked um, image. And that's it. Then I save this out. Save it to the Dropbox that we've got stuff in. Finish files. Transistor 41. I was naming it. They could, uh, their podcast transistor renames the files anyways. And then I have to turn on Dropbox so that it syncs. And uh, away you go. So... Just to show you, this is who I am. You can uh, contact me, the old contact button. If you'd like to get started, you can check out my portfolio of other podcasts I do. And like I mentioned, Copen Radio. And uh, yeah. So thanks for watching this. Feel free to leave a comment if you have a question about how I edit podcasts, how you might edit podcasts, if you want me to edit podcasts for you, what how that works, etc. Uh, like Justin said in the video if, or in the podcast that I just edited, yeah, I'd love to help folks get started podcasting, figure out how to unblock something that's getting them stuck in podcasting and technology in general. So I'd love to make a video or answer your question on a future podcast, etc. But for now, thanks for watching. I'm going to turn off the stream and uh, go have some lunch. Bye.